Welcome to BizHack Live, our weekly series on digital marketing. My name is Dan Gretsch. I'm the founder and CEO of BizHack Academy, and I'm incredibly excited to welcome uh, Emily Oyani of Foursquare today to talk about the role of location data in marketing. Now, a lot of you may remember Foursquare as an early pioneer in you would do check-ins at physical locations. You'd go to a restaurant and check in on Foursquare. They've evolved a lot in, in the decade or so uh, since they were founded, and they've really become now an enterprise data company specializing in geolocation and geographical data. And we're going to learn about how location data can help any sized business market itself. Now, I wanted to recognize our partners of BizHack Live, the folks who make this possible, Creation Station, the American Marketing Association, South Florida Chapter, CIC Miami, which has co-working spaces around the country, including in Miami, where we're based, the South Florida Integrated Marketing Association, thank you so much for helping us promote today's event, and the Miami Marketers Group. I also wanted to announce that we have formed a partnership with Grow With Google. And in fact, uh, this is Grow With Google Week. And in, in addition to today's webinar with Emily, we have a webinar in partnership with them called Make Your Website Work For You and uh, Reach Customers Online With Google. These are free webinars, part of the Grow With Google program. Both of them are led by Sixia Divine. Uh, who is one of the Grow With Google instructors. Very proud uh, of that partnership and the efforts that Grow With Google uh, and BizHack are making to educate small business owners around the world. So I wanted to remind you guys to put your questions in the Q&A. Uh, really welcome uh, as robust a conversation as possible. In each of your, uh, at the bottom of your window, you should see a Q&A uh, option and you can click on that and add your questions um, for Emily and I will be taking questions in a rolling way so it, I will be bringing your questions in as they come up um, we're going to be sharing these slides and a link to the recording and other resources via email uh, by midday tomorrow so don't feel like you need to take mad notes as Emily's going through a presentation we will be sharing those slides with you and then the recording uh, will be posted on the BizHack Academy YouTube page I recommend that you subscribe so that you can keep uh, updated on all of the amazing program that we're doing as part of the BizHack Live. So without further ado, I want to welcome Emily Oyani. She's an account manager of data and insights at Foursquare. Emily, her job is to synthesize location data into actionable insights for brands, agencies, publishers, and platforms. And I've specifically asked her to talk today about how even small businesses with relatively small budgets can use some of these tactics uh, and, and leverage them to get more intimate and more understanding of their ideal customers. When you have this data, this location data, it enables you to uncover and capitalize on behavioral trends. And behavioral marketing is one of the most important ways of targeting your ideal customer. Prior to Foursquare, Emily worked for a couple large advertising agencies, including Gray and FCB in New York. And it is a real pleasure, Emily, to have you here uh, today to talk to us about location data. Welcome to BizHack Live. Awesome. Thanks, Dan, for the wonderful introduction. I'm excited to be here and also wanted to thank everyone who attended. Um, so with that, we'll get right into it and I will pull up my screen. Awesome. Everyone see that okay? Yeah. Okay, so for those of you who might not be as familiar with Foursquare, we'll talk a little bit about who we are, um, and then we'll dive into some top trends that we've identified throughout the COVID-19 pandemic. Um, so location is at the center of everything we do. We understand location, how people move through the real world, and how those patterns change over time. Um, we use that knowledge and our proprietary technologies to help brands, developers, marketers, and analysts um, understand consumers and engage with them. And we've been powering the places in your pocket for years. 
Um, so if you ever typed in a venue in Uber or added a geo filter to Snapchat or um, even geotagged a tweet in Twitter, that's all powered by Foursquare. And our solutions help businesses make smarter decisions, developers create more engaging experiences and help brands build more effective marketing strategies. Um, to talk a little bit through our evolution, um, we've certainly come a long way since the check-in app. Um, we have over 30 years of combined experience in the location data space. Foursquare first started um, in 2009 when we built our owned and operated apps. Four years later, we built Pilgrim, which is our proprietary in-house technology that's allowed us to gather a ton of valuable data um, to better understand consumers in the physical world. And through that, we shifted our focus to embracing B2B solutions and allowing others to build on that technology. In 2014, we began licensing places, which is our map of the world. And we began introducing measurement solutions, media business, analytics, and also allowed others to use our SDK. In 2019, we acquired Place from Snap, and that was a tremendous acquisition because it fully accelerated our measurement capabilities, specifically our attribution solution. Um, and then less than a year later, we merged with Factual, bringing um, in a huge programmatic advantage and advanced targeting capabilities, resulting in Foursquare Today, which is currently the leading independent location technology platform. So location has become more important than ever, and especially now amidst times of great uncertainty. So um, it's an indication of intent in real time. It reveals nuances of who people really are and how consumers, um, how their behavior has shifted over time. The pandemic has undoubtedly been a year of unprecedented change. Um, so retailers, restaurants, and hospitality brands alike have seen a significant shift in consumer behavior, both in person and online. Um, and throughout the pandemic, we've been closely monitoring the changes and trends in consumer behavior across various categories, including retail, travel, dining, and entertainment. Um, and as we start to see things come back to a sense of normalcy, brands are increasingly looking to that trusted data to inform business decisions like where to open and close locations or how to best reach post-pandemic visitors. So today we'll revisit some of the key trends we've identified throughout the first year of the pandemic, and then we'll talk through some of the ways in which brands, marketers, and analysts can use that data to better understand shifts in consumer behavior, but also to inform personalized marketing engagements in this post-pandemic world. So how do we do it? First, we'll talk a little bit about our methodology. So we analyze foot traffic of millions of Americans that make up our always on panel. All of that data is either anonymized, pseudo anonymized and aggregated and is normalized against the US census. And that's to remove any age, gender or geographical bias. For this analysis, we use index foot traffic to demonstrate the relative decline or uptick in visits to different places where the first day would be 100. So to smooth that curve, we analyze on a rolling seven day basis to reduce the effects influenced by certain days of the week. So for example, you might expect nightclubs or bars to typically experience an uptick on Fridays and Saturdays. Um, we also used um, the week of February 13th through the 19th of last year as our first seven day benchmark period. Um, this is when we last estimated foot traffic to be normal before the pandemic. So what are the, some of the top trends that we've identified? Um, one of the major trends we've seen throughout the pandemic is that consumer behavior is certainly varying by audience. So younger people ages 25 to 34 are generally more out and about um, compared to older audiences, and women are typically showing a higher propensity to visit certain places um, more than men. In the next few slides, we'll take a closer look at foot traffic to shops and services overall, um, and that includes everything from restaurants, retail stores, um, hotels, auto dealerships. And so in this first chart here, we're looking at foot traffic to locations um, by age group. So we're seeing that foot traffic to shops and service locations overall picked up notably across all age groups during the holidays and has continued to rise in recent months as the vaccine has become more widely available. Um, unsurprisingly, we're seeing that younger people ages 25 to 34, so mainly millennials, have been generally more out and about compared to other age groups throughout the pandemic, um, and visits remain slightly elevated amongst this group in recent months, still up 6% as of late March. Um, in contrast, we see that foot traffic is much slower to recover amongst older audiences as expected. Um, so amongst that older audience ages 65 and up, we're seeing that you know, they're much higher risk and likely exercising more caution and therefore visits are still slower to recover down 8% as of late March. If we take a closer look at foot traffic trends by gender, 
um, we see that traffic was really following a similar trend throughout the summer months um, amongst both men and women, um, though now we're seeing that women are generally showing a higher propensity to visit places than men in this recovery phase that we're entering. So this trend was especially evident during the holidays, and perhaps we can attribute that to women being more likely to shop for holiday gifts in stores versus online compared to men despite the pandemic. We also see that recovery um, varies greatly by geographic location and population density. So throughout the pandemic, we've continued to take a closer look at foot traffic by region, state, and by DMA. Um, so if you take a closer look at shops and service by region, we see that across almost all categories, including dining, travel, retail, we've seen that traffic shows the greatest signs of recovery in both the Midwest and the Northeast. Um, visits picked up considerably in both of these regions in early August and has remained well above that normal pre-pandemic levels throughout the holidays. Um, in fact, foot traffic in these regions has remained elevated um, throughout late March, still up 13 to 14% respectively. Um, unsurprisingly, we see that foot traffic has been much slower to recover in the West compared to other regions um, hit hardest by the pandemic and still remains down 3% as of late March. We've also seen a consistent trend in traffic recovery based on population density. So foot traffic in sh to shops and service locations in rural areas surpassed pre-pandemic levels as of late April last year. Um, perhaps this is an indication that people in these areas were more likely to return to dining out at restaurants or shopping at brick and mortar stores um, as more non-essential businesses reopened last spring. Um, visits have remained elevated in rural areas throughout the pandemic and are still up 22% as of late March. Meanwhile, visits in more densely populated urban centers have remained well below pre-pandemic levels um, throughout 2020, um, still down 13% as of late March, while visits have returned to roughly normal levels in suburban areas. The pandemic has also introduced a lot of flexibility into consumers' weekday schedules, um, as many professionals were forced to work remotely within weeks of the outbreak last March. So as a result, most retail categories saw an uptick in foot traffic midday and midweek as opposed to evenings and weekends compared to pre-pandemic visitation. Um, this is likely because consumers were avoiding retail stores during prime shopping hours and instead visiting on off hours earlier in the day or earlier in the week to avoid long lines and big crowds. Um, we also saw a shorter dwell time across most categories, including retail and dining, um, indicating that consumers were likely taking advantage of contactless curbside pickup for online orders or perhaps picking up takeout from local restaurants. Um, another major trend we see by category is that people are definitely eager to travel again throughout, um, though traffic to airports has been slower to recover since the pandemic began. So airport visits have continued to pick up more notably in recent months, likely as a result of increased vaccination across the country. Um, however, visits to airports are still down 25% nationally as of late March. Visits to hotels, on the other hand, have picked up considerably throughout the pandemic, um, especially last summer perhaps driven by um, local travelers who are road tripping um, and is down only 7% nationally as of late March. If we layer on traffic to national parks and gas stations, we really see the contrast here in foot traffic recovery across various travel categories. So as traffic to airports, trains, and metro stations has remained well below normal, visits to gas stations and auto shops picked up considerably and has remained elevated throughout most of the pandemic. Um, gas station visits picked up um, considerably around like holiday weekends, like 4th of July, Memorial Day, Labor Day, perhaps indicating that people were taking local weekend getaways versus extended vacations further away at home. Um, so foot traffic to gas stations is actually still up 16% nationally as of late March. Um, at the same time, we're seeing national parks saw a considerable uptick in foot traffic throughout the summer, um, up 90% as of September 10th last year and still up 25% nationally as of late March this year. Um, so perhaps indicating that we can continue to see that national parks will remain a popular destination amongst summer travelers this year. 
Um, foot traffic across various retail categories revealed a preference for one-stop shopping amongst brick and mortar retail shoppers versus making multiple trips to specialty retailers. So foot traffic to big box and warehouse stores like Walmart and Costco really picked up in those early months of the pandemic as consumers stocked up on everyday essentials amidst time of great uncertainty. So foot traffic to department stores like Macy's and Kohl's was slower to recover in those early months of the pandemic, but definitely picked up considerably during the holidays largely driven by holiday shopping, um, revealing that preference for one-stop shopping across various departments in one place versus making multiple trips to those specialty retail stores. Um, visits to Big Box and Warehouse have returned to roughly normal levels as of late March this year, while visits to clothing stores, cosmetic, electronic stores like Best Buy or Sephora remain slightly down, still 7 to 10 percent as of late March. So across all retail categories, consumers are spending less time in stores, and that's likely because they're taking advantage of contactless curbside pickup for online orders. The pandemic has also resulted in a renewed focus on home improvement. So hardware stores like the Home Depot or Lowe's saw a significant spike in visits following the outbreak in early March last year, as many consumers were taking up home improvement or crafting projects while spending more time at home or in the early months of the pandemic. Um, visits to most non-essential categories like clothing stores, hotels, airports, gyms, um, restaurants were still down 64 to 74% as of April last year, while visits to hardware stores was up 56% nationally during that time um, and up most in the Midwest, so consistent with that regional trend that we identified earlier. Um, so visits to hardware stores has remained elevated throughout the pandemic and is actually still up 49% nationally as of late March this year. Movie theaters um, truly appear to be hit the hardest by the pandemic, so visits are still down 55% nationally as of March 31st. Meanwhile, visits to other entertainment venues such as theme parks, sports stadiums, and casinos have continued to pick up more considerably in recent months. Nightlife is also returning to roughly normal levels with visits to bars down only 5% nationally as of March 31st. When it comes to life at home, we're seeing that students are returning to classrooms while many professionals continue to work remotely. So foot traffic to schools has fluctuated throughout the pandemic, but has returned to roughly normal levels as of late March this year, um, probably indicating that many students have returned to the classroom for in-person learning. Meanwhile, foot traffic to offices has remained fairly stable in recent months, but is still down 18% nationally. Um, so while many professionals have returned to their place of work, others will still likely continue to work remotely for the foreseeable future, um, as many companies still continue to evaluate their work from home policies in light of the pandemic. Another major trend we're seeing is around fitness. So people who have, um, are really establishing new fitness routines at home and getting more active outdoors as a result of the pandemic. So unlike movie theaters, traffic to gyms and fitness centers has continued to gradually recover in recent months, um, though still remains down 15% nationally as of late March. Gyms remained um, closed throughout most of the pandemic, but retailers saw an increased demand for sporting goods and fitness, fitness equipment as a result. Um, and so while traffic to most specialty retailers was slow to recover, visits to sporting goods and outdoor supply stores like Dick's Sporting Goods or REI had surpassed that pre-pandemic level as of late May last year and remained elevated throughout the summer. Um, so this is really an indication that people were purchasing equipment um, for at-home fitness routines or shopping for outdoor gear for activities like hiking, climbing, or camping throughout the summer months. Um, both retail categories were especially popular amongst holiday travelers or holiday shoppers last year and have remained elevated in recent months, so still up 22 to 26 percent as of late March. Um, unsurprisingly, we see that foot traffic to outdoor destinations such as parks and trails has also remained elevated throughout the pandemic. Um, and while outdoor destinations typically see that seasonal uptick, under normal circumstances, these destinations were even more popular amongst consumers during the pandemic, regardless of those seasonality trends. Um, so if we take a closer look at year-over-year -year traffic to trails, for example, um, we see that visits were still up 32% as of January this year versus being down 23% as of January the year prior. Um, this is really an indication, again, that visits to outdoor destinations extended well beyond that typical season um, due to the pandemic. 
Um, so lastly, we see um, that people are returning to restaurants and bars, though still avoiding casual dining chains. Restaurants and bars across the country saw a significant decline in foot traffic following the outbreak of COVID last March, um, and visits remained consistently low in the months that followed. However, um, traffic to fast food chains like Taco Bell and McDonald's has returned to pre-pandemic levels as of last April um, and has remained fairly stable throughout the pandemic. And these chains rely heavily on contactless drive-through or takeout um, while many consumers were still avoiding those sit-down restaurants. Um, foot traffic to independent restaurants returned to roughly normal levels last summer, likely due to um, some of those independent restaurants accommodating outdoor dining. Um, but visits have continued to pick up again, more notably in recent months, and are down only 15% as of late March. Uh, and while consumers are returning to restaurants for on-premise dining, visits to casual dining chains like Applebee's or IHOP certainly suffered most amongst those dining subcategories. Um, so we're seeing that they have been much slower to recover since the pandemic began, still down 22% as of late March. So what does this all mean? Uh, okay, so what does this all mean? Um, so consumers are still consuming. Uh, E-commerce is certainly a flagship um, for retailers, but location data has continued to show that people are eager to re-engage in the physical world, even as habits are shifting. So understanding how to engage with that audience in the post-pandemic world is more important than ever. Localization is also more important than ever. Um, so insights that we talk through today reveal how consumers truly, um, how consumer behavior truly does vary by region, state, and DMA. And so the strategies tailored by geography are critical to success. Um, understanding the competitive landscape at a macro level, for example, is just as critical as understanding it, um, the nuances that exist at that micro level. And lastly, aligning with consumers' mindset is key. So delivering the right message in the right moment does ensure relevance in today's rapidly changing landscape and building out a customized experience is going to be increasingly important as is the way you plan to reach those consumers in order to stay top of mind. So now we'll talk a little bit about how to take advantage of that type, the type of research that we presented today. So the beauty of location data, especially during the pandemic, is that it allows you to identify those who are staying at home versus those who are more out and about. And as we return to a sense of normalcy, it'll be critical to identify those who have returned to non-essential brick and mortar retailers, airports, movie theaters, um, versus those who are still exercising more caution in their day-to-day -day life. So by looking at location data in real time, you'll be able to segment those people, not just by age and gender, um, but also thinking about their real world physical observed behavior. So Foursquare offers a variety of resources, tools, and solutions that can help brands, marketers, and analysts plan, reach, and measure impact. So these location-based COVID insights can be actioned on in a myriad of ways. For example, our COVID insight series um, published monthly from which these trends were derived can be helped um, can be leveraged by brands and marketers to track the latest foot traffic trends by category, by region, by population density, um, and other insightful metrics. Um, solutions like location-based um, audiences and proximity targeting allow brands to segment audiences and also reach customers where they are in real time. So for example, reaching those who are shopping at grocery stores three times a week versus maybe those who are shopping only once one time per week. Um, or perhaps segmenting based on pre-pandemic um, behavior. So identifying consumers who were visiting your location frequently before the pandemic, or perhaps visiting competitors' locations before the pandemic. Um, marketers can also use the same technology to measure ad effectiveness on driving traffic to physical locations. Um, and so Foursquare Attribution is a really great way to measure if someone who is exposed to an ad 
um, if they're more likely to visit your location after having seen that ad. And this solution can help improve return on ad spend by analyzing and optimizing campaign performance with actionable reporting. And these are just some of the many ways in which um, you can action on some of the insights we presented today. And so with that, I will turn it back to Dan and open it up for Q&A. Perfect. Thank you so much. Um, a ton of data, obviously, you know, we were going to uh, nerd it out with you today and I'm excited about that. Um, I guess um, let's start with uh, a great question that we have from Joan Sparks. Uh, and uh, this was actually a question that I had as well, which is, you know, where does this data come from? Uh, Joan asked, is all the data from panels or is some of it collected from apps? Could you talk a little bit about where this data comes from? Yeah. So the data comes from multiple sources, but um, we primarily have two types of data sets available. So we have our places data, which is made up of over 95 million point of interest. So we're mapping in real time um, point of interest on this map of the world. And so that actually launched a few weeks ago, um, along with our enterprise API. Um, and it goes back upwards to three years. So it's looking at historical data, net new and present data. We also have our visits feed, which um, we ascertain the insights from this exact analyses and other recent analyses where we're looking at COVID insights. Um, and that goes back um, to July of last year and is readily available, can be used for enrichment strategies and helps create that clear picture. So um, the data is coming from mobile ad IDs. And so we're tracking um, consumers throughout the physical world based on the places that they're going. Gotcha. Would you mind um, taking uh, your screen so I can, um, you can stop your screen share? Yeah. Perfect. Um, so uh, is a lot of this data proprietary, some of it acquired? Is it kind of a combination of the two? Right. Yep. And we license our visit feed. So you can use that data for CRM enrichment, for example, to enhance your data sets. So we often combine data um, with other data sets to build a more richer picture of your consumer audience, who they are, where they're going, um, understanding their behavior in the physical world. Um, and so a lot of that data can be derived from combining with, you know, online purchase data, for example, um, and other data sets to really create that fuller picture by combining with location data. Got it. And let's get kind of nerdy for a second. Do you understand or could you share how location data is collected from say mobile devices? I'm assuming that you guys are doing this a lot from mobile devices. Could you talk a little bit about the sort of science behind that? Yeah, definitely. Um, so it's people data and places data. So again, we have our proprietary map of the world, our POI, and that's what we license out to, um, like I mentioned, if you've ever typed in a venue in Uber, um, that's powered by our POI map. Or if you've ever um, type, uh, geotagged something in um, Twitter, that's same concept there where it's pulling in that POI map. And so oftentimes we'll get data um, through our partners or, or other channels that are using our SDK. Um, and then the other way is through opting in um, to share data for people who are using um, the data in the real world. So people who- so, so POI is places of interest? Yes. Okay, and like when I do Google, is Google competitive with you? Do they have their own POI map? When, when I click like Google Maps and these places populate near me, that's, that's, their, that's a competitive offering? Exactly. And does, so who are your big competitors in the POI map? Like I remember Apple like broke off from Google um, a little bit ago uh, when it came to POI. And I'm just wondering, does Apple have its own POI map um, or do they license it from, from somewhere else? That's a good question. I actually don't know the answer to that, but I assume they have their own POI map. And how many, like, is is a big part of your business licensing this POI map to, you know, like, I can understand why, like, Twitter, you know, Google might see Twitter as a bit of a competitor, or, you know, they, they might not want to give access to the POI map to another social media platform. So, so then they have to go and look to someone like you. 
Could you talk to, uh, to the extent that you're able to share first about who are your competitors in that POI map space and, and, and who are some of your biggest clients who use your POI map? Yeah, um, so I would definitely say um, that Google or Facebook would likely be competitors in terms of having their own map in place. Um, and then in terms of licensing the data, so there's a couple of different solutions like I mentioned. So we have the places data set and we also have our visits product. Um, so for those, we are licensing out the data um, when there's a value exchange. So like a couponing service, for example, might use our um, data um, to provide mapping and in exchange they're adding value to the consumer who is using that application. Um, so they're more willing to share their location um, always on and um, in return, we're getting that value exchange by providing the data to them. Got it. Perfect. Thanks for letting us nerd it out there for a little bit. So that kind of map of places of interest is sort of the geography that you do all of your work on. And, and uh, so my assumption is that you use like cell towers to locate phones and then you map that over your places of interest and that's how you're able to tell, oh, they're in that store. Yeah, so um, our methodology is unique in how we're actually capturing the data. Um, so we um, geofence and we create points of interest. Um, and so it's based on how long somebody spends in that physical location to know whether they're passing by or if they're actually visiting that exact location. Um, so we're able to make the distinction between that and the way that we're mapping those physical places. Um, so that's one distinction, but also just the quality of the data um, that we're able to deliver is unrivaled by our top competitors um, in terms of, you know, privacy and accuracy um, and what we're able to provide. Um, one last question in this area, which is I'm a little unclear on how you know where someone is. Could you be very explicit and explain like I have my phone, it's in my pocket, I'm walking. How do you know where I am? Yeah, so um, we talked about so the millions of first and third party panel devices through which we're collecting the data. Um, and so that is really powering that map of the world. But um, when you pass through a physical location, um, it's logged first, um, based on the amount of time that you're spending in that physical location. So again, we're able to know whether you're just passing by um, or if you're spending time in that location. Um, and so based on that POI map, it's correlated to an exact um, place that is within that database to know if you are um, in a Kroger, for example, versus within the pharmacy of that Kroger. Um, so we can get super granular in terms of how um, we are mapping your physical location. Yeah, and you may have already said this, but could you explain what you mean by you know panels and first and third party partners? I, I'm I just want to make sure I really understand where this data is coming from and 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 what what a panel is. Yeah, definitely. Um, so we have over five million to five hundred million devices that we're looking at movement um, throughout the world at any given time, and so our map includes over. 130 million places um, in over 200 countries. And so our platform is truly global. Um, and so we offer um, the ability to look at those places in real time. Um, and so it's mapped based on movement in the world. Um, Got it. Um, just a quick, your head is getting cut off. So if you could, thank you. So a, a panel is kind of like, like a place uh, or is it like a, a Wi-Fi router? Like, I, yeah. I guess I'm like, so what panel, is, like, yeah. We have our first party panel and our third party panel. So first party of panel um, is where we're collecting data from um, the mobile devices directly versus our third party panel um, is collected through our third party partners. Um, and you, you, you know, you keep using the word panel, but I still don't know what that is. Could you just explain in English what a panel is? Yeah, so just the collection of devices. And is it, is it like, is a panel a physical object? No. It's just um, a way to refer to the collection of dice, uh, devices um, okay. of where we're ascertaining that uh, data from. And what, what 
mechanism is collecting those devices? That's still what I'm a little bit unclear about. Um, so that's pulled through mobile ad IDs. Okay, thank you. Yeah. So you have a mobile ad ID, which is then sending data to the cell phone tower uh, or the Wi-Fi router, and you're able through to basically collect that uh, through millions of different points and nodes and then really locate where people are. Is that roughly? Yeah. Okay. And then um, you are collecting that data proprietarily, first party, and then you're also buying that data from third parties. And it's that mix, that amalgam, where you're able to get this kind of map of movement, which was where all the data you shared was based off. Yeah. So we're not actually buying data um, from anyone, but we are collecting it through our third party partners. Got it. Okay. Uh, and some of those third parties are your clients, and some of them might just be data partners, and then yeah. maybe you share the data back with them. Okay. Um, the other uh, question is Foursquare uh, started as a check in app, which was like a voluntarily, like, hey, I am here. But it's evolved away from that kind of retail and consumer focus. Yeah. Um, I guess what's happened is back in the day, you needed to volunteer your location. Now we have technologies that allow us to kind of figure out your location without you volunteering it. Is that, is that right? Like there's no more volunteering, there's no more Foursquare check in, checking in? So there is, we still have our active own and operated apps. So Foursquare City Guide and Swarm are still active. Mm. Um, we still have a dedicated loyal fan base there, um, but that's definitely not where we ascertain it the majority of our data now. Yeah. Um, and that's how we started out. That's, I mean, I remember, you know, I'm kind of OG internet. Like I remember Foursquare and the big check-in movement and it kind of was like a fad that came and went. Um, yeah. It seems like checking in isn't as much of a thing anymore. Um, do you have any idea or do you guys think, like what happened? Did just consumer behavior change and you guys had to pivot in response? Is that more or less what happened? Yeah, I mean, I think initially this was really before the rise of social media. So people weren't as actively sharing right. their location. And so they were using the check-in app as a way of understanding where their friends were um, and really planning their social calendars around that um, versus as like things like Facebook and Instagram really started to become yeah. more relevant and popular. Um, people really start stopped um, sharing their location. Uh, yeah, I think Facebook kind of ate that, that, you know, just like it's eaten so many other things, it kind of ate that into it and, and absorbed it into its Facebook and Instagram. Mm -hmm. And even LinkedIn, like you can actually share your LinkedIn profile to other people near you. So like, it's almost become embedded now inside of the big social media, as opposed to like a standalone functionality. Exactly. So whereas like some functions that used to be embedded, like Facebook's messaging is now extracted from it in, in messages and WhatsApp, other things that used to be sort of standalone, like Foursquare have become embedded now into the kind of core functionality of a lot of these platforms. What's also, you know, happened is Foursquare easily probably, and maybe they even had an opportunity to get like absorbed by one of these big companies. Um, and that often happens, you'll like see some innovation, um, you know, a great example of that, of course, is Snapchat um, and stories, and then Facebook copied that and built that into their app, both on Instagram and on, on Facebook, and Snapchat's now kind of left in the cold. So you'll see these like innovations that happen with like one tactic that one company gets really good at doing and then building out and then they'll either get acquired or copied, um, which, and Facebook, by the way, is really good at copying others. Um, they have very good developers and they're very fast followers and they've made their own innovations and copied a lot of others. We have a ton of amazing questions. Thank you guys for those. Let me run through a couple of them. So um, one of them is uh, specific, you know, we're, uh, Steve, Stephen Karski asked, is there a way to collect contact information for people who visited Miami in past months from out of state, or at least from out of the region? Yeah, so we don't collect um, contact information, but we can tell you about you know, the demographics of certain visitors at a category or chain level, um, or a DMA level even. Um, and so we could look specifically at Miami, who, people who visited um, a certain category or a certain chain within that region or within that um, city 
and we could tell you, you know, the general age um, or gender or um, really just demographic data about that audience, but not, um, you know, direct contact information. Yeah. And I think what he was more talking about is the people who visited but don't live in an area. Mm -hmm. um, and what I can tell you is that is standard uh, across many social media platforms. For instance, in Facebook ads, you can actually target people who are visiting an area but don't live there. Yep. So that, that kind of data is pretty readily available, even in platforms like Facebook, which you know you as a small business can uh, log into and use. Uh, you also use the term DMA, which means designated marketing area. That a DMA is what advertisers use to define a region. Uh, and so, for example, you know you have Miami, which is in Miami Dade County. You have Broward, which is in Broward County. You have Palm Beach, which is in Palm Beach County, uh, or West Palm Beach, which is a major city in West Palm. Uh, in Palm Beach County, and then you have the DMA of South Florida, which includes all three. So DMAs often don't really follow like county or geographic boundary, county lines. They're more about media uh, areas. So, so that's what a DMA is. I know, Emily, you've worked in advertising forever. So, so that uh, you can even target DMAs, uh, you know, in Facebook and other uh, platforms when you're doing your targeted ads. So we had a question, what would be the best advice for a mom and pop business with a storefront to take advantage of some of the data that you've shared today? Yeah, great question. Um, we actually just did a report on the impact of COVID-19 on small businesses and how that compared to um, large retail chains and um, casual dining chains versus independent restaurants. And so some of the um, key insights from that were around how um, some of those larger chains have really adapted to accommodating in-store pickup for online orders or takeout. Um, versus delivery. And so I think recommendations would be just based on what we're seeing with shorter dwell times, um, that it's more important than ever that those small businesses are really adapting to that shift in consumer behavior and accommodating, um, you know, consumers who are more cautious and less willing to dine in or shop in stores, but are still willing to travel to those locations to pick things up. Got it. So let's talk about that idea of a dwell time. So do you have actual numbers like what what it, how much has dwell time or the time when someone just kind of is like in the store? Uh, how much is that re reduced uh, post COVID? It really depends on the category we're looking at, but you are seeing a significant decline. So people are generally spending, you know, five to 10 minutes in stores versus pre pandemic. They were spending anywhere between, you know, 15 to 60 minutes in stores. Um, Got it. So what that means for a small business is if you're dealing with five to 10 minutes rather than 15 to 60, that means that you need to be able to basically get them what they need and get them out of there faster. And so ways that you could do that would include things like allowing people to order ahead, whether it's by telephone or online. That would mean things like curbside pickup. That would mean things like, you know, um, having uh, faster and more efficient checkout and uh, processes and using technology to do that, having contactless checkout as well, which isn't so much about dwell time, but just about safety and comfort. So. As a small business, as a storefront, you need to recognize that the trend, the data is showing that people's dwell time is, you know, a fifth of what it used to be. People want to be in and out. They don't feel comfortable inside of a store. Um, and frankly, that's probably a really good thing for you to get good at because nobody really wants to hang out waiting in line to check out uh, or spend unnecessary time. Not only are you competing with post COVID security, safety, safety measures, but you're also competing with the convenience of Amazon. And so, you know, God knows that like, even in a post COVID world where so many of us are now used to getting our groceries delivered, you know, you have to create um, two types of experiences in your store. One, incredible efficiency and getting people in and out quickly so that they don't feel compelled to buy it online next time. And then number two is what value adds can you provide in the in-store experience that make it worth the time and expense and, and trouble to actually go there physically rather than just do it online. And I think that that second part is really the, that's really more the next phase 
like if we want to bring people back to storefronts and locations, we need to give them something pretty special because a lot of us have gotten really used to getting everything at home. Absolutely. Have you seen, do you have a data of just like how much more time qualitatively, quantitatively people are spending at home? Is it gone up by like a thousand percent? Like, do you, do you have that data? I'm curious. So we're not tracking, you know, time spent at residences, but we can really just track where they're going in the physical world when they leave their home. Um, but the other um, call out, I think, for small businesses would be um, just the trend that we covered within this analysis, which is that people are really shifting behavior in terms of when they're going out and about. So, you know, visiting restaurants and retail stores more midday and midweek versus um, on weekends or later in the evening. And obviously, a lot of that is attributed to shorter um, you know, hours of operation, places closing earlier than normal, um, but people, again, just obviously wanting to avoid crowds. So um, really planning their visits around going at off hours versus those more typically crowded um, hours. Yeah. You know, I wanted to go back to um, just some of the nerdy stuff for a second. Raheem Amer, uh, and this is a great question, asked, does the customer have to have something open on their mobile phone in order for you to track them when they're inside of a geofence area? Nope. <laughs> in other words, well, let me ask you this, which is the sort of related question, which is, is there a way to opt out of this? Is there a privacy setting on your phone where you can be like, I don't want my location data being collected? Absolutely. And especially with, you know, recent iOS updates, you know, privacy has obviously become so much more important um, in today's world. And so there's multiple levels of opt-in where you, you are acknowledging that you are sharing your location, um, either always on in the background or um, when you have your app open. Um, so there's definitely ways to um, opt-in or opt out of those preferences. Yeah. Um, Raheem also asked, then can we market to people that enter competitive competitors' geofence areas? Yeah, so we do um, a ton of competitive analyses where we'll look at, you know, for a particular brand, people who are visiting competitive locations to understand, uh, um, you know, that audience and people who are visiting competitors, where else are they more likely to shop or dine? Um, and who are they, you know, generally what age, what gender? Um, and so trying to understand what we can about the competitive audience based on visitation to competitors' locations. Yeah. You know, one of the nice things about this approach is that, you know, the data, you know, this, this allows you real insights into, you know, your competitors. And I, I imagine that some of your clients include, you know, retailers who want to keep an eye on what, you know, who's going where. Yeah. Um, we have a, 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 and then Raheem, I uh, love these questions, Raheem, uh, is asked, can we send them specials and coupons uh, based on where they're physically located that are like geo located and what is, um, yeah. Are you able, like, if you merge this, is it real time location data? Could you like deliver just in time coupons and yeah. offers based? Yeah. And yeah pro through proximity targeting, you can reach customers in real time, um, based on where they are in the physical world at a given time and can deliver timely messaging. Um, so you can reach people who, um, have been seen within a certain distance of a gas station or a grocery store um, and deliver that real-time messaging through that type of solution. Yeah, my, my last company before I started BizHack was a marketing gamification company. And one of the technologies that we were developing there was um, predictive coupons and offers that used, among other things, location data as to what kind of offer you would be more likely to, to want. And so for instance, if we see that you're walking down Main Street and you engage in one of our pieces of marketing, the coupons and, the, and, the, and would be actually related to specifically the stores and retail storefronts where you're located in that moment. And honestly, you know, we're seeing this already, it's part of the today and it's certainly gonna be part of the future, which is, you know, advertising will know exactly where you are and it will deliver just in time offers. Yeah. Um, and to be honest, this is, yes, it's super creepy, right? But you know, digital marketing is creepy, but the other thing is it's super convenient 
like, wouldn't it be nice if you were walking down Main Street in your town and if you told your phone you wanted this, coupons for each of those storefronts would pop up um, and say, hey, you know, today is ribs day at Flanagan's, 50% off, you know, a full rack of ribs. And that might, that might be something you would actually want to know in that context. So, um, you know, there, there's a lot of um, the, the, the big counter argument to the obvious privacy concerns is convenience. Um, and just in time and, um, you know, real time ads that, that use the context of where you are and what you like and is, is, is the, the benefit to you uh, is that you're getting uh, ads that are more relevant. Um, and that you're more likely to want. Um, yeah. I, I don't want to minimize the the privacy and security concerns, which are are real and and not insignificant. And I think what we have done as consumers is we've kind of made a, a deal with the devil, where we are willing to give up some of our uh, privacy, sometimes knowingly, a lot of times unknowingly, in exchange for better advertising experiences that are more tailored to our interests. Um, you know, time was that you just got coupons in this uh, in the Sunday paper and ads that were blasted at you during uh, TV shows, uh, and now the ads, if the advertisers are doing their job, are much more relevant and targeted, and hopefully serving you better. Um, so, so there is. Um, it, it is a complex question in a complex world. Emily, my, one of my questions to you, and then there are a couple more in the Q&A before we wrap up, is do you think that we are entering... So we have been kind of open kimono about our data as consumers, um, and there's been a lot uh, of abuses of that, um, and there's been a lot of security breaches around that. And there's, I think, an increased level of awareness among consumers about that. And I'm wondering if, but we've also seen that even informed consumers don't seem to opt out. And so I'm wondering if inside of Foursquare, you guys uh, think that we're entering a new phase uh, of data and privacy where we're going to, consumers are going to be a little bit pickier uh, about what data they allow and, and, and so forth. And, and we can see in the new Apple iOS kind of an enhanced level of security that gives you more granular control over which apps you allow to track you. Mm -hmm. um, do you think that that's the world we're entering or do you think, you know, the and, and the heyday of, you know, kind of unfettered access to customer data is kind of coming to an end and we're entering a new phase? Or do you think, does Foursquare believe that this data is going to keep flowing and maybe even increase in the coming days and years? Yeah, no, great question. And I think it's a little bit of both. I think we are adapting to, you know, the changes that are coming up with iOS and also, you know, making those adjustments so that we can stay um, relevant and keep collecting the data um, as we possibly can. And so our apps do have double opt-in consent, like I mentioned, um, and we have, you know, a team that's fully dedicated to privacy and compliance, um, but really at our core is privacy. So um, it's something that we value most and as do our clients. And so, you know, obviously the landscape of privacy is changing, like you just mentioned. So it's imperative that our team, um, you know, ensures that all of our data sets are GDPR and CCPA compliant. Um, and so we are, you know, working to adapt to those changes and um, making sure that everything's in place to comply with whatever privacy um, regulations come our way. Yeah, and, and this is anonymized data. So even though we're tracking individuals, um, we're not attaching names or contact information to that. Exactly. And, and this is important because you probably can tell that Emily is using a technical definition of privacy and I'm using a more kind of lay definition of privacy. For Emily, anonymized data is private data. But for me, my phone knowing and all these companies tracking my location is not private. So th this is one of the things is, is 
as a company, uh, I mean, as a culture, we're going to have a lot of these debates about what does privacy even mean? Is it is it privacy that I have a phone that's tracking my every action and movement, but it doesn't have my name attached to it? Is that privacy? And Foursquare would probably say yes. Uh, others may say no. And I think that what we're seeing now with the Facebook uh, pushback against Apple's privacy is Apple is as guilty as Facebook and Google and everyone else of tracking your behavior uh, on the phones and building products that leverage that data. Um, they are positioning themselves, however, as kind of protectors uh, of your privacy and giving you as a consumer more levers to control it. And it will be very interesting to watch how that plays out uh, over the coming weeks and years. Um, Joan Sparks asked, are most of your customers from agencies or the marketing departments of larger brands? Can you talk just uh, quickly about who Foursquare's kind of ideal customers are? Yeah, so it really does span the full gamut. So we work with Brands Direct, but we also work with agencies. Um, and so we work with you know, marketing teams, analysts, data research teams. Um, so it really depends what product um, to, you know, inform what team we would be working with, but it runs really every vertical and every category. So we have, um, you know, clients in Fortune 500 across dining, retail, travel, hospitality. Um, so really any, you know, auto. So really any vertical that you can think of, we have clients that we service within that category. So um, I want to wrap up with a great question, which is from uh, Andre uh, Maligine. And he asked, do you have any predictions for the coming months? I love that question. Thank you, Andre. It's a great one to end with. Been saving yeah. it up. Definitely a great question. Um, so we don't like to get too predictive because obviously things change and, you know, who's to say, you know, based on past behavior, what we can expect to see. But I think we'll definitely continue to keep a pulse on foot traffic across those categories that we've been monitoring since the pandemic began. I think um, movie theaters and entertainment in general is going to be a really um, important one to keep an eye on since we're seeing very little recovery there. So um, as like streaming has become more increasingly available, um, a lot of, you know, theaters or movie um, companies are going direct to consumer with, um, you know, the latest releases. It'll be really interesting to see how that behavior um, picks up again and how it evolves um, for movie theaters, but also for dining, um, you know, continuing to keep an eye on how much time people are spending in restaurants, um, you know, shorter dwell time if people are, um, you know, continuing to pick up takeout versus dining in um, as we continue to move through this recovery phase. So I think dining and entertainment are all going to be really interesting categories to keep our pulse on. Um, and be what about... Um do you think there are certain categories of dining that will do better than others? I know that you said that kind of the fast casual actually did better. Um, fine dining has suffered. Do you think that we might see a return to more fine dining? Do you have a, a prediction around that? Yeah, I think based on what we've seen in the data, fast food has obviously, you know, already bounced back, returned to normal, um, and has even remained elevated. And I think that's mainly because of the drive through service and the ability to, you know, quickly go in and go out with ordering your meal um, versus casual dining chains. A lot of them haven't been able to adapt to accommodating outdoor dining in the way that independent restaurants have. Um, and I think, I think that's why we're seeing independent restaurants have recovered a lot more quickly than casual dining chains. So if any of those dining chains we think would be um, more impacted long-term or slower to recover, I think we would definitely be casual dining over any of the other subcategories we're looking at. And that's interesting that you're hearing, seeing that independence, um, independent restaurants are actually adapting faster. Um, I've noticed that in fitness and I wanted to ask you about fitness studios. Um, we've seen, you've said, you said in the data that fitness studios were a little more resilient um, and have seen a faster return than other spaces. 
Do you think, based on that data, that fitness is uh, in store for uh, recovery? I don't know if you've heard the term the COVID-19. <laughs> Those are the 19 pounds that many of us have gained since we've been uh, not able to do our class pass or uh, you know, spin class regimens. Do you think that in, 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 to combat the COVID-19, we might see actually a real bounce back to maybe even past pre-COVID levels of some of these fitness studios? Yeah, no, that's a great question. I think at its core, you're always going to have those fitness enthusiasts who would prefer to work out at a gym versus at home. So I think that's why we've seen um, foot traffic to gym recover as quickly as it has um, compared to like visits to movie theaters, obviously still way below normal. Um, but interestingly, interestingly, you're seeing that foot traffic to sporting goods stores and outdoor supply stores has remained well above that normal level. Um, and so that's really an indication that people are continuing to exercise at home um, and shop accordingly to improve their at home fitness routines or really just being more active outdoors. So, you know, yeah traffic to golf courses, for example, um, really picking up throughout the pandemic or tennis courts or really any sort of outdoor recreational facilities um, that offer, you know, consumers the ability to get active. Um, but I think we'll definitely see the return of gyms, but it's a question of to what extent. Yeah. So here's, here's the um, kind of advice that I would give any <clears throat> location-based business, which is you must spend a lot of time thinking about the customer's experience inside of your store and how that experience has changed permanently as a result of COVID. So one of the things that has happened is all of us have gotten used to the convenience of being able to order online and have it delivered sometimes in the same day onto our doorstep. And so that is independent of the pandemic. And that is not something we're going to forget. And so if you do have a storefront experience, a, a location-based experience, whether you're a restaurant or a gym, you have to think really hard about why someone would want to take the trouble to come to you when they can work out using their phone at home or order from Amazon. There are really compelling answers to that question. We do not live in a digital world. We live in a world where human to human contact is more crucial and more necessary than ever. But we do live in a world where those businesses that can't figure out how to create location-based experiences that are worth the trouble are going to die. And those companies that figure out how to make an sort of an unforgettable physical experience will thrive. People will flock to you. Like you have to think really hard, walk into the store like you'd never been in there before, like you're a stranger from another planet and make sure that every aspect of the store is efficient, friendly, and provides value. And you will do great. Emily, thank you so much for your time, your expertise, your insights, your data. We really appreciate it. Thank you for having me. Um, I wanted to quickly wrap up by sharing really exciting news. Um, BizHack has recently started a training grants program. There are federal and state grants that can help defray the costs of BizHack's training. Um, we focus on companies in New York and in Florida with 10 or more employees. And so if you are a company that fits in that criteria, strongly recommend that you reach out to us at BizHack uh, and let us know. Um, and we'd love to work with you on applying for and getting those grants, which will help defray some of the costs of BizHack's training for your staff. So coming up uh, tomorrow is make your website work for you. This is part of our Grow with Google week. We also have reach customers online with Google. If you go to our Facebook or our Instagram, you can get more information about those events. They're going to be great. Next Wednesday, we have Accelerating Growth with Brand Power. This is specifically geared to B2B companies uh, and with Ed Delia, who has been working for years in the branding space. And then the week after that, I'm going to be doing my signature um, presentation on the BizHack lead building system. 
the product of seven years and 700 small businesses worked with. It is a efficient and proven process for marketing your small business. Don't miss it. Send your friends. Can't wait to have you guys there in two weeks on Cinco de Mayo. Uh, we've partnered with the Idea Center at Miami Dade College on this. Uh, and so we're expecting a big crowd and really looking forward to that. And then finally, if you're interested in signing up for all of our season three uh, events, uh, please uh, go ahead and join our season pass program. You'll get um, reminders and uh, follow-up emails from all of our upcoming events so you don't have to register for them individually. And with that, I wanna say thank you to Emily and Foursquare. Thank you to Safima for putting us in touch and for promoting this. And we'll see you here next week. My name is Dan Gretsch with BizHack and we'll be back next week with BizHack Live. Bye everybody.